So this will be a summarizing lecture that will talk about the general mechanisms of viral pathogenesis. The question you may have in your mind is that how is it different from bacterial, fungal, parasitic, and so on and so forth. And the other important thing that you have to keep in mind is that viruses basically are important. And in your pharmacy practice, you will come across quite a few patients, quite a few drugs that will help you to understand the basic physiology and basic pathology of viral diseases. Now, let me give you an idea that a master slide, because uh, some of the slides are master slides, and uh, you may, and I will spend some time on that. And it will also be a, a review that what is different than between a bacterial infection and a viral infection, beginning from the size of the virus, portal of entry, how is it handled by the immune system, what are the clinical features of viruses as a whole, and how are they transmitted to other people? And then finally, uh, what are the clinical features and uh, how do we treat them? So that will give you an overall picture. And I want you to pay attention uh, to this master slide over here. And again, this is from your book. And you can see from here, the very first column in this case is, of course, uh, time period, time period that when you get exposed to a virus. I would uh, not go in detail in terms of epidemiology of those viruses, but I think you can appreciate that uh, virus, viruses are ubiquitous, they are everywhere, and uh, we need to have our own protection from all the way from a good hygiene to some of the safety mechanisms that we have and then finally, uh, we have to have a good immune system because uh, viruses do need a good immune system. And they basically, I, I usually say it's like a treadmill. So they put you to that tolerance. You, you get to, to know how much tolerant, how good is your immune system, and you can work it up from there. So you can see contagion, as the word suggests, that the virus particle is ready to invade, it is prepared, and you acquire the virus. So that acquisition of virus is the first stage. And you can see from here, especially this column over here, since this is a journal slide, so you can see it, ha it can be anywhere from a second, the moment you got a virus, to a period of hours and days and weeks and sometime even in HIV years. So how would your system know and how would you know that you have touched a virus, inhaled a virus and taken in a virus in food or you have been a kind of transferred a virus by living a, in a certain ecosystem or in a in an environment from people around you, from animals around you, from plants around you, and so on and so forth. So during that time when you are acquiring, and you can pay attention to this part over here, which is considered as a start of the problem, that there is something we call prodrome, prodrome. So prodrome is something, something is coming up. You get that feeling that I'm going to get sick. So that kind of a feeling you have before you actually become sick. 
So that's a classical uh, thing for viruses. So it, it kind of warning, it kind of prepares you for that. So you can see prodrome over here in the first column. Now, having said that, some of the viruses may have a longer prodrome. And you can see from here, it can go shorter prodrome. You have a sy symptom securing, and then you have a healing process. As to some other viruses, where prodrome stretches all the way through. So you go through that feeling, as I said, when I taught you hepatitis the other day, uh, I said that uh, the classical sign of hepatitis is that your liver gets inflamed. So when your liver gets inflamed, liver is a vital organ. It is a metabolic organ. So the very first thing that you will see is nausea. That's again very particular. And then uh, uh, the second thing is that you will have a pain there. You will have a right hypochondriac pain suggesting to you that inflammation is localized where the target tissue is. Okay? And the third thing is you will have anorexia. Right? And I gave a mnemonic as well the other day uh, for these three uh, features that are normally. And then again, liver function test will be compromised. So depending upon which organ is the target of that particular uh, virus, you will see symptoms accordingly. Okay? Now, why do you get that? In the prodromal phase, you, you are getting exposed to your virus and your immune system is fighting off that virus. So that initial activity that's taking place, your system is fighting a virus, is where you have this flu-like symptoms. That's what we classically say flu-like symptom, and all of us have gone through that. There are many other words that classify malaise, feeling of being tired, feeling of being unwell, and feeling of something coming up. So that kind of feeling is there in the, in the typical viral infections. Then, what is the target of that particular virus? So the target of viruses, some of the viruses are, no matter which is the route of their entry, because route of the entry of any microorganism has to be skin and mucous membrane. Because these are the protective layers, a part of our innate immune response that we have. So it's gonna be coming from our skin or it's going to go to our mucous membrane. And then again, if you want to divide that into different uh, portal of entries, nasal, oral, eye, ear, genital urinary system, anything that is exposed to exterior will remain as a target. And then again, air may be a source, food and water can be a source, and any other thing uh, that enters our body in terms of a foreign substance can become a source. For example, you are injected with something and that's not sterile, okay? And you apply something on your body or surface which is not sterile or just contaminated. So you can see there are portal of entry. Then the second question you have to ask yourself, what is the primary site of replication? So virus has to divide. So depending upon which is the route of entry of that particular virus, it's going to go and divide there. Because virus has to divide. It has to reach that critical mass where it's going to cause problems. So there is something we talked about, viral load. And you can see from here, a typical area that primary replication sites are either in a respiratory system, gastrointestinal system, for herpes in the skin, papilloma, genitalia, and so on and so forth, depending upon what's the site of infection. So from the primary replication, it can go to secondary site of replication. And many a time, you wonder how would a virus reach that secondary site? And remember, most of the time is blood. So we have viremia. Viremia. Somebody was asking me the difference between bacteremia and septicemia. Uh, bacteremia is for bacteria only. And septicemia could be for anything. It could be from viruses, bacteria, fungi, because a septic shock is a totally different aspect of the overhaul, uh, you know, shocks that we have in terms of physiological responses. So you can see that we have viremia and 
once you have a viremia, so virus is in the blood. So if you give that blood to somebody, or if you have an injury that blood comes in contact with somebody, it can go from blood to your secretions. So it, all your body secretions, salivary, you know, skin, genital urinary, urine, feces, all the secretions that are there, you will shed off viruses. And these viruses, of course, then be transmitted to uh, fomites, anything that comes in contact with you, your utensils, the people uh, coming in contact with you uh, in any form. So you will transmit that to them. And the other thing that may happen, for example, an insect bite. So a mosquito comes on your surface and bites you. It's going to pick up that virus and take it to bite to the next person. So that can also happen. And then uh, the third thing that can happen is that some of the viruses want to spread locally. They don't want to spread systemically. So that, again, will be something that we need to consider. And once that cycle is over, you either control that virus or you succumb and lose the fight to those viruses. And then viruses will cause a very special type of damage we call cytopathology. Cyto means cell. They are going to to kill yourself because they need to uh, divide, they need to replicate, and they're going to use you as a means of their replication. And then again, uh, also keep in mind some of the common sense thing, for example, if some virus goes into blood, so these viruses can be easily spread to wherever the blood takes them. So you can see from here, for example, when you talk about viremia, the target tissue can be any tissue because it's in the blood. Okay, and uh, the chapter that I wanted you to uh, study on your own, uh, the, the lecture number nine, basically classifies those viruses in terms of their preference. For example, the first top virus that's going to cause problem in, for lungs, cause problem for skin, cause problem for, you know, brain, so and so forth. Okay. So let's move to the other one. So we talked about the infection of the target tissue. As I, sa I said earlier, virus gains entry into the body. It has to be skin and mucous membrane. Uh, if there are additional elements, cuts, bites, injections, ulcers, or you get something in your eyes, respiratory tract, mouth, genitalia. So anything that is foreign is contaminated by viruses and it comes to your contact. Now also keep in mind the uh, aspect of innate immunity. So innate immunity, for example, IgA is important. So if you don't have an IgA there, uh, again, virus will have an easy access. But as a whole, most of the viruses come from inhalation. So we inhale viruses. So that's like a common theme for viruses that we inhale virus. The next question is that what kind of uh, what determines as to what kind of disease we will have in terms of the nature of the disease. So there are six important aspects of a viral infection that will determine as to what kind of disease you will have. Number one is the target tissue. Number two is the portal of entry of virus. Number three is excess of virus to the target tissue. For the tissue tropism of virus. Remember I said tropism is affinity liking. So viruses come equipped with some receptors. For example, we talked of H, H1, H and N, you know, GB120, sorry. H1 was influenza. So these GP proteins, glycoproteins, are going to attach CD4 receptors. We have permissive nefs of cells for viral replication. Most of our cells are permissive per se. They cannot say no when a virus knocks at the door. Also depends upon how pathogenic that particular strain of virus is. Some of the viral strain may not be that uh, pathogenic. Remember we said, for example, influenza C is not as bad as an A. So common uh, cold virus is not as bad as influenza A virus. So viruses have the inherent ability to be pathogenic or not pathogenic. What determines the severity of disease? For example, two people get infected with the same virus. What determines what will be the course of these two people? 
in your books, they will say, okay, you can recover from this virus within a week for some other two weeks. So they give you like a time frame. And every one of us is unique. So every one of us is different. But what is it that will tell you how, how severe form of disease that you may get? Again, number one, there are two important things uh, related to virus, number one, and related to yourself as well. So they are viral factor and their host factor. One of the viral factors that you can see, the ability of these viruses to cause damage, right? Then again, the rest of the stuff basically is coming from you. So how stronger a fight are you going to give to that virus? Viruses are tests of your immune system. So that will tell you where does your immunity stand at. So that's immune status. Not only the status, but the competence it also determines whether you've been prior either infected by that virus or being vaccinated by that virus. So if you have been vaccinated for that particular virus, so you're go, going to stand a chance of fighting off. For example, all of us have been vaccinated for hepatitis B virus. Not that we would not be exposed to hepatitis B virus. When you work in health related, you will be, but then you have protective antibody. So that will change the course of those who get vaccinated. Immunopathology means what kind of damage you have. Virus inoculum size also depends upon the size of virus. I mean inoculum. For example, you get a bigger chunk of virus that will stress your system out more as compared to the smaller chunk that you will get. For example, if you are washing your hand with soap and water for 10 minutes, you're going to reduce the viral load on your hand as compared to you not washing your hand at all or washing it uh, less than the prescribed time. Then again, length of time before resolution of infection, general health of population, nutrition. Also remember that uh, many a time, especially for the kids, because their immunity is developing, so they, they can be malnourished. So if they are malnourished, you have to keep in mind, most of the especially humoral immunity is antibodies. So if you are protein deficient, right, that's a problem, especially for those people who go uh, for you know, these kind of diet programs where they would advise that don't do this and don't do that. So that would stress out your nutrition element because proteins have to become, you know, regardless of what type of food habit you have, your body needs proteins because proteins are the major constituents of your protection. So you have to make sure that your nutrition state is there. If you have any other disease going on at the same time like chronic illnesses, your body is only fighting a war with that particular uh, you know, disease. So again, to build up another battlefront is going to stress the system. And genetic makeup, I, I personally think, and I'm pretty sure you will appreciate that, would also make a lot of difference. We all are genetically different. So we may have our, our share of genes and our share of infection and our share of dealing with these microorganisms, especially viruses, very, very different from the person sitting next to us or the person, you know. Uh, at the most, I would uh, argue that siblings may share uh, some of the genetic characteristics. So it runs in the families, runs in such and such thing. But genetic predisposition is important for viral infection. And then again, age is important. Age is important in terms of immune system because uh, the extreme of ages are where you should have more viral infection as compared to you being in your prime. So as we discussed in the AIDS patient, uh, that uh, early 20s, 25, 23 young healthy males should not have uh, pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, PCP, should not have pneumonia at all. So if they do have a pneumonia, so this means something weird is happening to the immune system. So this has to be investigated. Now, uh, how does the virus progress? How does the virus disease progress? Again, uh, same players, whatever we have discussed so far, are the same determinants for the progression of the viral disease. Acquisition incubation period because remember sometimes some of the viruses have this ability that they would not cause a disease at the time will hibernate is called latent viruses they will disappear 
especially the most obnoxious one are the one that go in the nervous system sit over there for your lifetime and wait for the time to reappear and come back and cause problem over and over again uh, your immune response and then again uh, one important thing for these viruses is that their ability to cause chronic infection, chronicity. So chronicity is something that is there and like for example, if you have a, a common cold in winter, doesn't protect you from the common cold next year. So you will have repeated infections of common cold. So viruses will come over and over again. So uh, the important thing though is that we need to find out uh, the potential outcome of viral infection in terms of cellular biology. That's what I want you to pay attention today and I think uh, that will also help you to determine as to how do we treat them. So there are three uh, potential outcomes that you need to know. So the virus gets into your system. What are the three options? Number one, failed infection. Virus gets aborted. Nothing happens. Number two is it goes and enters your cell, you have a lytic infection. And number three is that uh, it doesn't cause the cell death, it, but it replicates in your cell we call persistent infection. And these are three important aspects, I repeat, abortive, lytic, and persistent infection. So what causes a failed infection? Failed infections usually are coming from uh, viral mutants. So there are some viral mutants that once they uh, enter into your system, they basically uh, do, do not multiply. So they have this ability not to multiply and they become mutant. And also remember that may, may be a course for us to cause that mutation in some of the viruses so we, they are unable to multiply. The second thing can happen is a persistent infection. So persistent infection can be because of four different uh, types. It could be chronic, which is also called non-lytic or productive. It could be latent, which means a limited viral macromolecular synthesis, but, uh, but no viral synthesis. So it can disappear, so it doesn't need to divide at that particular time, disappear. It can come over and over again, recurrent, or it can transform. Which one of these four do you think are, have the ability to cause cancer, for example? One. Who said one? Okay. Any other guess? Which one of the four has an ability to cause cancer? Four. Four. Because it's going to transform. I just told you the other, other day that we create this cancer cell lines by immortalizing those cells. We have viruses infect those cells, so these cells will live, or live forever. That's the problem with cancer, it's an uncontrolled growth. So transformation is the major thing that will lead to uh, their ability to be oncogenic. Now, what other are determinants of the viral pathogenesis? Again, you can see from here, interaction of virus with the target tissue, how accessible the virus is to the target tissue, and then uh, some of the viruses may not be stable at that particular temperature, and some of the virus may not be stable at pH, different pH. And then again, uh, also viruses have to have an ability to cross gastrointestinal tract into the bloodstream. That's another important thing. And just keep in mind when we talked about uh, enveloped versus non-enveloped viruses. So which one of these viruses uh, stand better chances of causing gastrointestinal uh, disease, naked or enveloped? Naked. naked. Yeah, because enveloped have a bilipid layer. So bilipid layer is going to get digested by these enzymes over there. Okay, it's, it's as simple as that. And then again, uh, their ability to cause viremia, they are going to spread to reticular endothelial system. That's a system, lymphatic system, which includes blood. Uh, this includes, of course, blood, uh, liver, spleen, lymph nodes. If I ask you what is reticular endothelial system, it contains liver, spleen, and lymph nodes. And then again, uh, the viruses come with their attachment proteins, 
and then the tissues have those specific receptors, so they have to kind of interlock. Now, uh, what are the host protective responses? Of course, as I said, that uh, your immune, immune system should be patent, and you should be vaccinated. If you look at the immunization schedule, quite a few viruses are there that uh, we have to have uh, an immunity based upon immunization. And many times we may have had those uh, infections in the past. They may, may give us lifelong immunity, or we can basically have a specific, uh, what do you call, antigen-specific immune responses in terms of the memory B cells or memory T cells that are already been built up in our system. The moment they see the virus, they start making antibodies. One of the general cytokine that is required for a host protective response is, what is the most important cytokine that we have to have to protect ourselves generally from all viruses? Sorry? Cytokine. As usual, and the answer is already there, interferon. You just have to pay attention or change your glasses, whichever way you want to. Okay. Interferon. Interferon. Interferon, I said gamma interferon is uh, something that's always there to help to boost your immune system. And many times we give it to the people as well. But that wasn't meant for any pe people wearing glasses, so please don't take it personally. So, uh, the, the immune system basically is producing interferon. That's why many a time when you are get a, given a interferon per se as a vaccine, you get like flu-like symptoms. You have T-cell responses because T-cells are required to take care of uh, viruses. And then again, we need antibodies and other uh, important inflammatory mediators that are required. When we say uh, viral disease, what do we mean by that? Again, uh, there are two terms that we normally talk about. One is your susceptibility, the other is severity. So these are two important factors, basically, that are a gateway for you to know how would you tolerate a viral disease, and then again, as we discussed earlier as well, if I was to make four points, uh, the mechanism of exposure and site of infection are important. Again, your immune status, status, age, and general health, viral dose, and genetics of the virus and genetics of host as well. So again, genetics of virus mean that a virus has those genes that we talked about yesterday, especially for HIV, which will give a potential virulent factor to viruses, and then your own genes, which they are protective or not. The next question you have to ask yourself, epidemiology, what are the mechanisms of viral transmission? So you need to know, uh, as a healthcare provider, what kind of safety can you uh, have in terms of protecting yourself from such an offensive if it comes to the viruses. So these are considered as mechanism of viral transmission. As I said, the most common route of infection is respiratory system, so aerosol, so the air you breathe, so that's what the viruses are coming from, the food and water you consume, and then anything that comes in contact with you, so your tissues, clothes, and uh, any direct contact with the secretions that you have with people, uh, sexual transmission basically means both. Uh, well, it could be a, a reproductive sexual transmission where the intent is for the production of offspring or it could be a childbirth per se because most of the organs uh, like uterus uh, are utilized and then vaginal canal for delivery of the baby. So they also are some of the ways that viruses are transmitted. Blood transmission, organ transmutation and again zoonosis from the zoo or some of the insects that can transfer those viruses. What are the other factors that promote this transmission that we have talked so about? So uh, again, the same question, whether the viruses are enveloped or non-enveloped, whether they have ability to uh, 
replicate or survive into those transmissible secretions. And uh, the danger in these uh, cases is that sometimes there's an asymptomatic transmission and you don't have any symptoms and then you can easily shed the virus. Remember this concept of receptor uh, virus shedding. So virus shedding will mean that you have already acquired the viruses and you're shedding off in the environment, in the ecosystem. That's why many times in some of the viral infections, we uh, isolate the patient, we quarantine the patient, and you heard the story of Ebola virus, what was going on. If somebody asks you uh, what are the risk factors of uh, a particular person in terms of acquiring that virus, for example, if you were to work in, a, in Africa to go and help yourself, help people for fighting an Ebola virus, so they will definitely want you to uh, take care of the risk factors. And again, also if you are to work in the hospital setting and come across the patient, your age, health, immune status, occupation, travel history, lifestyle, children in daycare center, and your sexual activity. So these are all some of the risk factors that would put you in a, a vulnerable position in terms of acquiring those viruses. Critical community size, that's another important thing. Uh, we did not per se discuss that. But also remember that if you happen to be with the community that uh, as a whole is a zero negative for that particular virus, and then you can be a source of uh, giving them that particular virus. It's just like a, I just give an example, Ebola virus person, he travels and uh, comes to your community. So people get that kind of a, a you know, a critical um, community size. For example, I think the best example would be that if you are an Ebola nurse working in Africa and then you come to work in the hospital and then you're exposed to all those people, the question will be whether you should be allowed to do that or you should be uh, considered as zero negative before you are allowed to work over there. Geography and seasonal factors are always there. If you happen to travel to those areas, uh, most of the time, uh, viruses outbursts are there in communal setting, in the daycare centers, in the schools and colleges, in military, so on and so forth, where uh, people are grouped together and they kind of are flocked together for extensive periods of time. One of the examples was that if you are a transatlantic flight, a flight it takes like eight hours. So you are there in a closed setting, the person sitting next to you is sharing the same airspace. So if the uh, ventilation system is not properly working, or even if it's working, you do stand a high chance of acquiring that particular uh, virus that any one of those people may have had. So how do you control? Uh, how do you control? What, what are the options that we have? Well, uh, quarantine, is, they, all, they have quarantine in all the airports, they do. So if they know that if you're coming from those areas where any of these viral infections are endemic, and uh, they do see signs of that, and they figure it out, and uh, many a times, I, I don't know whether you have noticed the immigration officers uh, basically are trained for that. So they should, they will determine that and ask if they do find some sign. Remember when there was uh, this bird flu and swine flu, so they had these people taking your temperature before you board on to the flights. So that was an index that if you were a high fever, they would not let you board the flight because you are a, a risk to, to the other people as well. The other important thing for control is elimination of the vector, for example, you know, if it's a bird flu, you want to eliminate all those birds. If it's a swine flu, I don't know what they would do. But uh, if that contaminated population is there and you have resources to eliminate that vector, so you should do that. A, a more subtle way or a better option will be you get yourself immunized. So make sure for all of us as well, I know that uh, it's mandatory. They're not going to even register you for the next class and, of course, if you don't give them their uh, you know, immunization record. Uh, but again, uh, if there are some areas where people, maybe under, underprivileged people are there, 
and uh, kids and children are not vaccinated. So that's something that we need to think of. So there may be a uh, discrepancy in terms of um, the incidences over there. And finally, if you do get uh, viral infections, you must have heard over and over again, it's a cycle, it's gonna complete, you need plenty of fluid, bed rest, and so on and so forth. That is true, that again is true. But I also said the other day, uh, your homeostatic mechanism is that your body will respond to it. And many times, typically when your blood pressure runs low, so your body will make you collapse, so you can fall on the ground, and then the blood pressure will come back, because once you're in this supine position, so your blood pressure will be different as compared to erect positions that you have. And then again, uh, viral, antiviral therapy is there, by all means, very expensive. Not everybody can afford it, not all the insurance companies will cover it up, uh, but uh, the point over here is that, as I said the other day, the challenge for viral infection is that some of the viral infection, you, you have to be on the top of the game, so to speak. So you have to diagnose it ASAP, start therapy immediately. You don't want to miss this window of opportunity that I said is 72 hours for some of the viruses, especially if you want to give uh, oral or intravenous acyclovir or any, any other antiviral drugs that are there. Otherwise, after that, that period, the viral dose will be out of control. So these are some treatment options that are available. I also discussed yesterday uh, about the Tamiflu, and you keep in mind that is a, if you look at the replicative cycle of a virus, it's way end in the game. So what's happening is virus has already attached, penetrated, uncoated, transcribed, translated, macromolecular synthesis has started, viral assembly is taking place, now it's ready to bud out. So you want to go and stop the release of virus, that's what Tamiflu does, right? So again, you can see that uh, it's a little bit late in the game, but of course it's effective. So these are some of the treatment options that we have. Okay, and uh, the last slide for today. Uh, Another important concept, I think I, will, I may have discussed, uh, dis discussed that in quite a few uh, virology lectures, uh, acute infection versus uh, chronic infection. The uh, infections that are there, especially for viruses being in a latent phase, and some of the viruses which are there when they become chronic uh, can lead to cancer. We talked about especially HPV. We talked about that in some other viruses as well, especially hepatitis B virus. We talked about it in hepatitis C viruses because you have chronic infections. So if you pay attention to this uh, graph over here, so you can see in, over here it says time in terms of years. So viral infections, we are talking about months and years. It's a long, 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 long type of infection. So you can see right from the the easiest and the commonest mode of viral infection is that you get common cold. And uh, the blue represents the presence of virus. You can see presence of virus over there. And the green, the middle one, actually indicates the episode of disease. So you can see it like a pyramid. The episode of disease occurs when the viral load is maximum. That's what this graph, the, the graph tells you. Okay? Now, some of the viral infections, like measles, have very rare complication that you have an acute infection, again, pretty much the same, but there is a rare late complication, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, SSPE, and you can see it comes later on. But there's no way for us to pick up or detect the virus while you're going through that phase. The, uh, the most notorious and uh, most uh, scary picture that we have for an acute virus changing into persistent virus is a latent infection that happens in varicella zoster, the causative agent for shingles. So latent infection, again, you will see that uh, the disease episode is where the virus load is maximum. 
And then you have periods of being non-infectious. So you're non-infectious, but it recurs back. So it recurs back. This means that virus is not seen in your blood, but the virus is hidden in your neurons, and it's very difficult to isolate and pick them up from those sensory neurons, so they will come over and over again. And that's what uh, happens in, in shingles. But that's supposedly should not happen to uh, a normal adult. So it happens especially uh, for all statistical purposes over 50. So the CDC requirement is that all those people over 60 should get shingles vaccine. And as, as I said, uh, since this was discovered in 2006, that's what the recommendation was. Now they just altered it that those people who have had family history, or who have had any past um, episodes, they should get af after the age of 50. So that's very uh, a, a good vaccine which is available, but keep that in mind, is a live attenuated vaccine. Okay, and those of uh, us who have had chicken pox, they basically already have this immunity. It doesn't preclude them from not getting shingles, but it does preclude them from not getting uh, that chicken pox again. So if a person who is suffering from a very zoster uh, infection and he happens to pass it on to the other people, the other people would get chicken pox if he's not vaccinated. He would not get shingles. So shingles basically comes after you've been exposed to the virus and your body has responded in terms of chicken pox. So that's an example for a virus which is latent, which is hidden, and which will keep on coming back, especially if your immune system declines. So these are the three classical viral pathogenic phases that we see normally uh, and very commonly. But the other part, for example, the last three scenarios or last four scenarios are the, uh, well, let me rephrase, last two scenarios are chronic infection. So you get this chronic infection. The classical example for this chronic infection is basically hepatitis B. So you can see a big problem. Do you see the big problem? What problem do you see in hep if you were to compare hepatitis uh, B with any of the above pictures for herpes zoster, for measles or common cold, what difference do you see? What is the difference in the graph? Yeah. Correct. There is a constant shedding of virus, and the reason being, well, the, if you pay attention, say blue indicates blue represents presence of virus. So this means that there cannot be any time that you are free of virus. So you have a virus load and you are always continuously shedding it off. Does that make sense? So you may not see the actual disease. So your disease episode is gone. So there's no need. But you, the rest of your life, you are just gifting those virus to people who come across with you. So that's why hepatitis B remains as one of the notorious STIs that it is sexually transmitted where they shed off this virus and give it to the people. The other example for chronic infection, and these are the, some of the questions which I'm explaining to you, I'm going to ask you. Okay, so if you compare this chronic infection, hepatitis B, versus a chronic infection, which is HIV, for example, this is also a chronic infection. So what is the difference that you see between hepatitis B infection and HIV? Multiple episodes, good. So you can see in hepatitis B, we just had one disease episode, but in this case, it could be multiple episodes. And the second reason, the second scary thing for HIV is again, that virus is present all the time. So the person has a virus load all the time. And the commonest route of spread, spread of these viruses, sexual transmission. So for all the STIs, especially viral STIs, these two are very important in terms of uh, transmissible of viruses. Okay, does that make sense? All right. And 
Another example in this case that I have not taught you, but just for comparative purposes, keep in mind we call slow infection. And slow infection, I, I think I gave this topic to one of you. Did anybody present on prions? I'm pretty sure. Who presented this individual project on prions? No? Or maybe the person is absent. I do remember that it was given as a project. So the prion story is that you basically built up the virus load till you get an infection. So you can see, you get infected. Over years, you built up the momentum. is seeping rise, and then you get the disease episode. So these are some of the comparative things that are important. OK? And this happens to be one of my favorite slides. So you can imagine. Favorite slides usually get quite a few questions. So I'll, I'll repeat you. I want you to compare uh, two acute infections. One is a common cold versus measles on the top two. Then I want you to compare latent infection, which is very zoster. And I want you to compare two chronic infections and how they are different. And I want you to compare a, a slow infection. And you pretty much. I think have an idea that one of my favorite questions is combination questions. So I'm going to give like a prion and then give you a combination of what type of infections are there. So it's, that's the easiest way for me to check that you understand this, this concept over here in terms of viral diseases, in terms of, but I think I, I want you to appreciate, as one of you just said, the uh, shedding of virus, shedding of virus. Now, if somebody asks you, for example, if, I'm, if I have a common cold, am I shedding virus? If I ask you, I have common cold, am I shedding virus? No. Well, he said yes, right? You said yes? You just nodding. Why? Why do you say yes? You're right. You're right. I'm not saying you are right, but I'm asking you, why do you think that you... Because remember... Virus shedding can only take place when there's a virus. The only difference is while you're infected. While you're infected, you have a viral load. You can spread it to other people, right? So that's only that small chunk of time. If you compare that with an acute, again, the small chunk of time. So what the point is, when you are going through that infection, you are shedding it out, giving it to your partner or your whosoever comes in, socially con comes in contact with you, okay? And if, you, if somebody asks you, for example, like measles person, the measles person is infective when he is having measles. But after that, he is not. Make sense? No, varicella zoster person is infective during the time when the person is having that infection. Okay? And then again, unless and until... So whenever that particular person for herpes zoster virus is in infectious condition, he is giving it off, shedding it off to other people. But during the interval, he is not. And the reason being, because it is a latent infection, it has hidden in neurons. Okay? So what you would advise to the person is that when you are going through that acute infection phase, you want to be separated from the rest of the community so don't pass it on. But the problem remains with these two people. That's why you have to either get vaccinated for hepatitis B, right? I don't know what about. For HIV, at least, you have to be sure that you don't involve yourself in those high-risk uh, behavior promiscuity and that kind of uh, thing that uh, is going to predispose you to that. Otherwise, this is for sure that you either are going to get hepatitis B or you're going to get for HIV. That is for sure. Okay? And then finally, slow infections. Again, prion is a classical example where you build up a momentum till you actually get the disease. Okay? Any questions?